is an organisational psychologist, a chartered scientist, CEO, and the first Brit to play in the NBA, who also partners with organisations to help leaders deliver on the promise of authentic, transformational leadership. He's a very busy guy, right? But he's actually made the time to be with us. So, John Amici, I'm handing it over to you. The floor is all yours. Appreciate it. Um, so there's lots for me to that I want to kind of build on what, what David said already, but I, I just want to kind of share some stuff that's happening here. I, I'm a, one of um, the directors of the country's largest NHS trust. I have 23,000 employees, 10,000 of whom are black and brown people who are disproportionately at risk from COVID and yet are in work every single day delivering and doing amazing stuff. I'm doing risk assessments on them on the basis that they will be doing their work regardless because without them we cannot do their work. And this is kind of a microcosm of the history of the United Kingdom, that much of what we want to do and achieve as a society cannot be done without the people we now call key workers who are disproportionately minority, black and brown and women. I think one of the things we have to recognize is the backdrop of what's happened with George Floyd. And I say this with all respect to him and his family, but I watched him being murdered, a knee upon his neck. And it's traumatizing to watch somebody be murdered because they look like you. But unfortunately, this isn't the first time I've watched it. It's not the first time I've been on an illustrious panel talking about it. For me, this has been every six weeks for the last 10 years. And the first time that I took, was asked to talk about this was 1991. I was still in university in America, actually. Rodney King being beaten in front of the world. So I am a pragmatist. I'm a scientist. I, I want to have hope. But we've been here before. And that's important for us to remember right now. We've been here before. Change is a science. It doesn't happen because of whim or beautiful rhetoric. It happens because people decide to take substantive and often very boring action, often action that won't lead you to be lauded. And so I suppose that's where I want to talk, talk about this and, and some of the impediments that we're facing. Because I think David was absolutely right. There is an eloquence of um, especially uh, white younger people uh, who are in these uh, protests, who are out there supporting Black Lives Matter. You hear them as they talk and there is a sophistication, an understanding of their own privilege, um, lots of elements of what we need. The ignorance that, that drives hate and drives bias is absent from so many of them. But what's interesting is that when you look at organizations, and, and, and my, my company, we work mostly with, with large private organizations, and you realize that that eloquence is not mirrored internally. Five minutes before I came on this session, I was talking to a CEO who, who stumbled and, and fumbled through what was going to be a five-minute introduction to a company, All Hands, talking about how racism is bad. That conversation included elements such as just now realizing that there was racism. And whilst the revelation is important, we have to recognize that what that means, there are implications for the fact that there are significant swathes of people just now finding out that racism happens and is real. Uh, I would say that David's point about most people recognizing the most obtuse, ugly, uh, and common forms of racism is absolutely right. People who yell the N-word, the P-word, and others. It's absolutely right. But there is a distinction because just because people recognize that really well, there is a significant number of people who don't at all recognize that racism is, is a real impediment in their environment. So, for example, one of the things that I've been talking to our clients about, which is really uncomfortable conversation, is that of is that of uh, meritocracy. Because most organizations, they like to believe that they're a meritocracy. Most people in societies that, that purport to be civilized like to believe that society is a meritocracy, but 
But there are real implications for that. If society is a meritocracy, if your organization is a meritocracy, it currently looks exactly as it's supposed to look on the, the crassest of measure. We know that you can't tell who's black simply by looking. We know that difference is not as simple as what is visual. But who you have currently is who you should have if your organization is a meritocracy. And this is an important thing to consider because if you believe your organization is a meritocracy, as you attempt to, to pull some of the levers that David talked about that are truly important, targets are a blunt instrument, but they are clearly one of the few things that work. As you attempt to leverage those things, the people in your organization will believe you to be a person who is actually unbalancing the system, is, is unfairly bringing through. And this hurts candidates who might make it through under that auspice because people start to believe that perhaps they aren't as qualified, perhaps they didn't earn their position. But once you realize that we're not in a meritocracy, and this does not mean that the people who are currently present didn't earn necessarily their position, it just means that people who worked as hard were as diligent and ambitious, who had the same quality qualifications, couldn't have earned it. And this is really important for us because as long as people think that we are somehow unbalancing an equal system, they'll always be disproportionate resistance. I think it's one of the things that is hardest for us to negotiate. The thing I think that's hardest for me to hear right now is, is outside of people just realizing there's racism, which I appreciate because I'm glad that they've had a revelation, but I'm also sad that they haven't been able to help me for the last 50 years. But the other part I think is difficult is hearing every day in workplaces, senior people in HR, senior people in C-suites and boards talk about how difficult it is to talk about race. And David alluded to it already, it is absolutely because most white people have never considered themselves as a racial being, because you only have to consider your race if you aren't white. But at the same time, when people say it's difficult to talk about race, think about the implications of that in your workplace. It means that in your life, in your workplace, you have never once created an authentic enough relationship with a single black person that they gave you any access to their experience in life. That is the implication of not knowing about the experience of black people. And one of the dangers that workplaces need to face right now is that a lot of black people are being, the emotional labor is being asked of them to provide solutions as if being black automatically makes you an expert in organizational change. I am, but that's because I studied it. I'm not an expert in organizational change because I'm black. I'm an expert in my own experience. And I think that workplaces have to be careful that we aren't making demands, further demands on black colleagues to try and be the solution when the problem doesn't lie with them. One of the other things that I think we need to rectify in workplaces is the approach we take to equity. So many times with different minorities, we see that the approach is that of the deficit model, right? You've seen this really clearly, probably, and, and I, I hope this is none of you, of course, but when, when we started to look at targets for women and starting to get to reduce some of the differential attrition and other things for women in organizations, suddenly we started to see these programs develop for women. And these programs would help junior women to be more assertive. They would help them to speak up in meetings. And then these women who endured this and went through processes and worked their way through an organization would get to a very, or at least a more senior level. And suddenly they were going through a new program. And this program was to make them less assertive because their colleagues and direct reports found it difficult coming from a woman. In other words, we spend a lot of time, and I'm seeing this around the solutions that many companies are coming up with for inequity when it comes to black and brown people. Many of the solutions appear to be a solution to armor a minority rather than de-weaponize uh, an environment. They seem to be solutions that are based on the fact that women and black people and Asians and people with disabilities or LGBT are somehow broken and therefore need to be fixed in order to progress, rather than the idea that the environment is differentially toxic to people who are not seen to fit. There's a big job of work here to do. And 
even when you're well-meaning, and I do believe that most people are well-meaning when it comes to these issues, we need to face up to the fact that the way we approach this is often from a very white-centric perspective. The idea that what women should aspire to is maleness and what black people should aspire to is whiteness. I know the reason that I have appeared, and many of you, I'm sorry, I will have, you would have been subjected to me over the last two weeks on every daytime television program out there. But I'm aware that the reason for that is because I am a couple of shades lighter than David. I'm aware that the reason for that is because I have a voice and I use words with three or four syllables occasionally, and that makes me absolutely the appropriate face to have a conversation with Bill and Holly. One of the things that happens at a time like this is that black people become homogenized. The idea that people of black Caribbean versus black African heritage, even that, the idea of having black African heritage as if Africa is a country. We need to start looking at people with their differences in mind. This is not a time to retreat into the colorblind territory. This is not a time to say, I don't see black people, I don't see gay people, I don't see women. Now is the time to really see people. I've been telling people who want to be great managers that one of the things that you can do is with every single person who's your direct report, you approach them with the idea of benign ignorance. I don't, I am not going to make any assumptions about who you are. I don't know who you are just by looking at you. But you marry that benign ignorance with enthusiastic inquisitiveness. I don't know who you are. I'm not going to make any assumptions. But I'm going to make it absolutely crystal clear that I want to know anything you're willing to tell me. One of the things about this period is that we want, in order to learn, we have to get people to disclose. Many of you in your organizations will have really low numbers of people who are willing to disclose, disclose their demographic data on your employee surveys. There is a reason for this. The reason is partly societal, but it is also about trust within organizations. Disclosure is not just a case of not wanting the rawness of what if a racist attack happens to me? What if my career is impinged by this? It's also the fact that disclosure has to be earned whether it be a manager, to a direct report, a peer to a peer, individuals to their organization. Disclosure has to be earned. And, and by that, by that I mean you have to consider identity differently and you have to consider disclosure differently. Most people are familiar with the, the idea of coming out for LGBT people. And people make a mistake when they hear or talk about coming out. Coming out can be about anything. You can be describing your experience as a black person, which is something that people are asking of their black colleagues now. It could be coming out as LGBT. It could be coming out as a person who never went to university despite everybody else around you having done so. And the thing you have to realize with coming out is it's not a statement about the person who is speaking. When an individual tells you something about themselves that is precious and important, especially when it's about their identity, they are not making a statement about themselves. They are making a profound statement about you. They are telling you that I have looked at you. I have looked at your words. I have made sure they are congruent with your deeds. And I have determined that you're the kind of person who will take my identity as precious as it is, and you will treat it with the care and respect that I do. This is the kind of environment that is inclusive where people can share identities as fragile and precious as Fabergé eggs with each other without fear of any one person smashing or disregarding. This is the kind of culture we need, and not because it's nice, because you may have gathered I'm not a warm and fuzzy psychologist. I want to win. And in, in a time when everything is thrown up in the air, in a time when there is disruption and it will continue, we need the very best brains in the room. And I'll take a little friction through difference in order to get the traction I need to win. Thank you.